Bibles and turn to Second Peter. Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one verse three says, "Seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who has called us by His own glory and excellence." I've selected to start the teaching by going to this verse of Scripture because I feel it points out something that should be relatively obvious to those of us that have a Christian orientation, and that is is that those things that pertain to life and godliness are understood through a true knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. It is through a knowledge of Him, of God, a true knowledge of Him, that we understand how to live life and how to have godliness as a part of our life. It says in verse 20, But know this first of all, that no prophecy of the Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For the prophecy was, was for no prophecy was ever made by any act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke for God. The scriptures that we have, that which is contained in the scripture is called prophecy. This prophecy that we read that's written in the scriptures was inspired by God. He moved men, holy men. He told holy men what to write. And then they wrote it in the book. We understand the Bible to be the Word of God. And it is the book that you should go to if you want to know things about life and about God. The Bible contains the knowledge of God. You don't go to a book on Excel to learn about God. You don't go to Abraham Lincoln books to learn about God. If you want to know the truth about God, then you go to the Scripture. If you want to know the truth about how to live life and live godly, a godly life, it's contained in the Scripture. It seems like a, such a simple point. In, in uh, chapter 2, verse 1, But false prophets, a prophet is one who speaks on behalf of another. A false prophet is one pretending to speak on behalf of God, but really is not speaking on God's behalf. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of, the way, because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. These false teachers, these false prophets, because of their communication, the way of the truth is maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Unfortunately, as much as we might not like it, what we just read is the truth. The Word of God contains the knowledge that God wants for His people to have, yet there have been and there continues to be false prophets and false teachers that don't teach that which is written in the Scripture. They don't teach it, or they don't teach it accurately. Consequently, many of the foundational beliefs of Christians is been maligned, or has been maligned. It is inaccurate. It is not true. This morning, in Gospel of John, please, chapter 6, this morning we're going to look at a subject matter that from a scriptural point of view is very, very clear. From a religious point of view, it is very, very unclear and the wrong doctrine on the subject is embraced, most, you know, the vast majority of Christians, at least if it's, if it's true from the communication of, you know, TV evangelists and radio evangelists and the many, many books that have been written all through many of the centuries, what is commonly believed about the dead is not in accordance with what is written in the Scripture. I don't like that, but nonetheless... It's still the case. And what I want to do, and what you should want to do, is to have our faith based upon the Scripture. Not what is contemporarily accepted, not what is, you know, what other people believe, but what does the Word of God say? In the Gospel of John, 
The words of our Lord Jesus Christ are communicated to us in chapter 6, in verse 39. It says, This is the will of Him who sent me, that of all that He has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life. And... I myself will raise him up on the last day. Verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws me. And I will raise him up on the last day. Three times in just a a brief section of Scripture. Now, I could go to many, many places in the Word of God to show you this truth. I'll just simply state it. What Jesus just said is the truth. That He is going to raise those up who have faith in Him on the last day. The common accepted belief is that when a person dies upon death, that they immediately ascend into heaven, or they ascend or descend into hell, or some believe that they would go in between to a place called purgatory. And, and yet, the scriptures say, and, we, and, and again, as we continue to read, it becomes very apparent. The scriptures say that when someone dies, that they're dead. And they're asleep, and they will remain asleep until the last day. That's what we just read. We read it three times. On the last day, during the last day, Jesus will raise them up. Not before that time. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. This is a great chapter to read in its entirety about the resurrection, but we'll just look at some of it today. John 15, 20. But now Jesus has been raised from the dead. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Jesus died and he got up from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. Jesus is the first one that this has happened to. Jesus is the first fruits. That's what first fruits mean. First fruits mean he was the first one that had it happen to him and that there will be others that follow after him. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and all the other people that believed before Jesus, when they died, they stayed in the grave. None of them got up and stayed up from the dead again. And Jesus is the first fruit. The question is, well... After Jesus, what happens to those that believe? Well, verse 21 says, For since by a man came death, that would be Adam, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, all what? So also in Christ will all be made what? Alive. But each to his own order. There's an order to this. Christ is the first fruits. Christ is the first one that got up from the dead. After that, those who are Christ, when? At His coming. When Jesus Christ comes back is when all those who are dead will be raised and resurrected like He was. Until that time, those who are dead are referred to in the Scriptures as being asleep. 1 Thessalonians, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians... On my first hearing of this information, it was very upsetting to me because all of my life I believed contrary to this. I believed what was contemporary, what, what, what most people believe, and that, well, it's not only contemporary, but what most people have believed, and that is that when you die, you're not really dead, but you ascend either to these locations that I've already mentioned. But the Scriptures clearly do not communicate this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 But we do not want you to be uninformed or ignorant. We don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. This past week was a most difficult week for me because two very beloved uh, believers have fallen asleep. John Martin in Ohio and Bob Koch in Long Island. Two men that have stood faithful for many, many years, decades, two men that really loved God and and never compromised on their faith, in that they continued until they died to have Jesus as their Lord. 
In, in, uh, I went to Bob's memorial service. I didn't go to John's. They, they haven't had one. But, uh, and, and I was, again, very much comforted by the scriptures that were communicated to me about our hope that when Christ comes back, there is going to be a resurrection of the dead. And then my beloved brothers like John and, and Bob are going to be raised from the dead and they are going to be with the Lord forever. This is what the, the Scriptures teach consistently throughout. There is, this is what is taught. The other belief that is common is not in the Scriptures. It is not what the Scriptures teach. You have to make up your mind. Do I believe what everybody else believes because they believe it? Or am I going to believe what I believe because it's written in the Scriptures? In uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.13, Be not... But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. In other words, God wants us to know about those that are dead, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we believe that, even so God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. That's the great promise. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Here's how it's going to happen. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will, first, will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we, so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Again, clearly stated in a, in, a, in, a, in a concise way. Jesus Christ is coming back. And, the, and it's not, He's not coming back in a secretive way. He's coming back in a very bodacious way, in a very bold way. Everybody is going to know that He's here. There's going to be a trumpet. There's going to be a shout. The voice of the archangel. <coughs> and then the dead are going to be raised at that time. If that should happen when we are alive, those of us that have faith, we will be changed and transformed and meet the, air, the dead in the air and so be with the Lord forever. We know from the Scriptures that the Lord's going to descend from heaven and He's going to set up His kingdom here on earth. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15 again, please. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 tells us, like 1 Thessalonians did, it tells us, the order of this and how it's going to happen. 1 Corinthians 15.1 Richard, did you change those wires? Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will rise imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable, that's our mortal bodies, must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. Talking about the perishable was talking about those that are dead. Their bodies are perishing. And those of us that are alive, we are mortal, we must put on immortality. But when the perishable will have put on imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Well, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the Lord. But thanks be to God who gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a victory over death when death is destroyed in which is recorded in the book of Revelation. What is that in verse and chapter 20, I think? In the, in the book of Revelation, we're told that death and hell or the grave is thrown into the lake of fire, just as is true of the devil. At that time, death will be destroyed. And at that time, then we will have the victory over death. Not until that time. There is no victory in death now. Death is very upsetting. Death, as you can read in this chapter, there's, you know, there's nothing, it's, it's very upsetting death. It's, it, there's a sting to it. But in that day, death will be destroyed because those that are dead are going to be raised and death will end up being no more. 
It says that death is the last enemy to be destroyed. So we can conclude that death is an enemy. Indeed, death is an enemy because death is the termination of life. If death was the advancement of life, in other words, if you died and you went to heaven, and then death wouldn't be an enemy, death would be a welcome friend. If death is the thing that is necessary for me to enter into God's kingdom and to be with God and to be with Christ forever, well, then death is not an enemy. Death is a gateway to this place called heaven that people speak of. But the, tr the truth is, according to the scripture, that death means death and that the people who are dead are asleep until the Lord comes back. The death is referred to as sleep. Now, I'd like to show you some of these scriptures. I have them up here on the screen so that I can show you a number of them quickly without you going to them in the Bible. They are written in your notes so that you can look at them later on on your own. In Job 3, 11 through 13, it says, Why did I not die at birth? Job was somewhat depressed at this point. Why, was I, why did I not die at birth? Come forth from the womb and expire. Why did the knees receive me and why the breast that I should suck? For now I would have lain down and been quiet. If he was dead, he would have been laying down and quiet. I would have slept then. And I would have been at rest. When you're dead, you're asleep, you're quiet, you're at rest. In Job 14, verses 12 through 15, it says, So man lies down and does not rise, until the heavens are no longer. He will not awake nor be aroused out of his sleep. Again, sleep and death are used interchangeably in the scriptures. And when does the man get up from this sleep, from this death? At, when the Lord comes back. Until the heavens are no longer, he will not awake nor be aroused out of his sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that's the grave, that you would conceal me until your wrath returns to you, that you would set a limit for me and remember me. If a man dies, will he live again? All the days of my struggle, I will wait until my change comes. The answer is yes. If a man dies, he will be changed. And that's what Job is saying. All, all the days of my struggle, I will wait until my change comes. When he puts on this imperishable. You will call and I will answer you. You will long for the work of your hands. In Psalm 13, 3, it says, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. Death is called sleep. In sleep, there is no awareness. The sleep of death, there is no awareness. There's no con cognizance of what's going on. In John 11, to, uh, in verses 11 through 14, talking about Lazarus, Jesus said, This he said, after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. The dead are asleep. But I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of a literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is what? Sleep and death are used interchangeably. In Acts 7.60, Stephen speaking, then, or talking about Stephen, falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold, them, their, hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. He died. In Acts 13, 36, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. In 1 Corinthians 11, 29 and 30, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. In other words, a number of them died. In 1 Corinthians 15, 6 and 17 through 20. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, talking about Jesus and his resurrected body. Most of who remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Some have died. If Christ has not been raised, our faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ 
have perished. If we have hope in Christ in this life alone, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who are asleep. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 and 10, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. In 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4, Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And again, I I know this is redundant, and uh, I apologize for that redundancy, but since this doctrine is so prevalent and is so commonly accepted, I thought the point of reiterating it over and over and over again would drive home that when you're dead, God says of that state of being that you are asleep. Now let's look and see what does that mean. Second Kings. We'll look at some of the places in the scriptures where it talks about those who are dead. Second Kings twenty two. You know, I, 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 uh, I've learned from from the scriptures and from and from living life that unrighteousness never accomplishes righteousness. An unrighteous deed does not bring about a righteous result. That's just not the way of God. And like it says in Hebrews, the wrath of man does not bring about the righteousness of God. If you go, if 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 you want the things of God to prevail, then you must sow the things of God. Truth, truth has to be our foundation. Any lie that we embrace always has negative ramifications to us. As parents, we are tempted at times to tell our children lies because we're trying to spare them pain or suffering or or whatever the case may be. As, As parents, we lie to our kids uh, like at the holiday times, we lie to them about Santa Claus so, so as to make it more fun and more enjoyable for them. And, you know, that's the, the rationale as to why we do this. But I would put before you that anything that's based upon a lie is not based upon something that is godly. God is about truth. There is no lies in God. There is no lies in God. And every lie that you tell has a negative ramification, not a positive ramification. And what you think is, is making a gateway for fun is sowing in individuals that they grow up and they understand that it is appropriate to lie at times as long as it's for the purpose of making people happy. That's not a good thing to be saying to anybody at any time. Any lie has a negative ramification to it. As is any truth that's embraced will have a positive ramification to it. And... Um, That, the reason I brought that up is because that is that the reason that this this thing about death and 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 you know that this helps people it helps people that when somebody has died to tell them that they are ascended into heaven. I've yet to be to a funeral and I've been to a lot. I've never heard a eulogy say what if this dirty dog is no dang good and I'm sure he went to hell. I've never heard anybody ever say that. I've, all the funerals I've ever been to, it's assumed no matter what this guy did or this woman did, he's ascended into heaven. It's an amazing thing. Even though we all know that the guy is really questionable that he even believed in God. See? So we're lying to each other. Well, that doesn't do anybody any good. We lie to people and say, well, they, they ascended into heaven. Well, you know, we know that he really wasn't that good, so he ascended into purgatory. And, you know, he's going to make it to heaven. Again, lies to bring comfort that doesn't bring comfort. It really, it, what it does is it sets cracks in the foundation of one's belief that will ultimately betray them later on in life. And I'll show you this as we continue to go on. Truth is the only thing that brings comfort. True comfort. The comfort that God wants to provide. I, you know, death has a sting to it, and you're not going to avoid that. You're just not going to avoid the sting. But you're not going to get rid of it by lying about it. In, uh, where did I tell you to go? Second Kings. First Samuel, First Kings, Second Kings, twenty-two. 
and verse 20. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes will not see all the evil which I bring on this place. So they brought back the word to the king. When a person is dead, they're no longer aware of what's going on in the world. They don't see all the evil that takes place because they don't see. They're in a deep sleep where there's no awareness. Look at um, Psalms, verse 6, Psalm 6. Job, Psalm 6. We're just going to look at some of these places where it talks about what it's, what the dead state is, the gravedom is. In uh, Psalm 6, 4. Return, O Lord, rescue my soul. Save me because of your loving kindness. Psalm 6, verse 4, verse 5. For there is no mention of you in death, in shalol, Who will give you thanks, Sheol? Who will give you thanks in the grave? You can't give thanks to God because you have no awareness. You have no ability to speak and to think. You're asleep. In uh, chapter 30, Psalm 30. That's why it's important to give God thanks now while you're alive. What profit is there, verse 9, Psalm 30, verse 9. What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit... For for the dust, will the dust praise you? Will it declare your faithfulness? The obvious answer is no. Those who are dead can no longer praise God. They can no longer declare God's faithfulness. That's why it's important to do now while we're alive. In 88, Psalm 88. This is not an all-exclusive understanding here of the dead, but this is some of it. In Psalm 88, in verse 10. Will you perform wonders for the dead? Will, they, will the departed spirits rise and praise you? Will your loving kindness be declared in the grave? Your faithfulness in the grave? Will your wonders be made known in, in the darkness and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? The obvious answer to the, all those questions should be no, because there is no awareness in the grave. In 146, Psalm 146. Verse 4. His spirit departs and he returns to the earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. When you die, in that very day, when you take your last breath, from that point on, your thoughts perish. You're asleep. In Ecclesiastes, keep on going. You got Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, or is it Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon? In uh, verse five of the ninth chapter, nine five. This is a this is well nine five. For the living know that they will die. But the dead do not know anything, nor have they any longer a reward for their memory is forgotten. You know, those of us that are alive know that we're going to die. Those that are dead, they don't know anything. They're dead. They don't have any awareness. It's it's gone. Now, uh, look at the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible at the other end, chapter 1. I... I could show you so many scriptures, and, and I just just this one, just to prove the point that I'm gonna I'm gonna state to you, and that is that uh, although the Bible talks about there being a body, a soul, and spirit, and these words are used, they're used often in the scripture. Uh, as a matter of fact, when when JoJo prophesied this morning. He, the, the, he talked about uh, loving God with your body, your soul, and your mind, and your strength. There are different aspects that make up us, make us who we are. Dif- let's not talk biblical for a minute. Let's just talk in common vernacular. I could say that, you know, that Vince, it, what makes me me is my brains, my personality, my breath, my body, my heart. There's a lot that makes up and composes me. But And all of this is me. Not one part. If you take one part of that out, that's not me. All of this makes me. 
and all of it, who, what you have makes you. The scriptures do talk about the spirit, and it does it does reference the, the soul, and it does talk about the body, and it does talk about the mind, but it, at no time does it ever talk about there being these aspects of our life being separated from each other. They never it never talks about the immortality of the soul or the immortality or the trans the, or the, the immortality of the soul or the immortality of the spirit. It talks about the immortality of the person, of the individual. It's, there is this doctrine that has crept into the church where basically from Platonic influence, from Plato's influence, Plato communicating on behalf of Socrates. It was Socrates, uh, when he took the hemlock, uh, when he was, it was, he was sentenced to death, and he took the poison that was going to take his life, told at that time in the communication that Plato wrote about him that it, don't worry about me, my soul is going to live on. Well, Plato came hundreds of years before Christ. That doctrine had crept into the church and was embraced by the church fathers early on after Christ to become this thing that there is a separation of spirit or soul that lives on forever and the body is the thing that decays. The scriptures do not teach that. The scriptures teach that when a person is raised from the dead, the person is raised from the dead. Not the person's body, not the person's soul or spirit, but the person himself. When Jesus got up from the dead, it wasn't his spirit that got up from the dead, or his mind that got up from the dead, or his body that got up from the dead. He got up from the dead. Everything about him got up from the dead. This division and separation of soul and body, which you can, you know, you can talk about my brain independent of my body. You can do that. But you can't take my brain out of my body. We, never mind. We're not gonna, you, you get the, you, you're not going to take my soul away from my body. If you do, I'm no longer. Okay. That seems like a silly point to have to make. But yet, it's such a predominant understanding that has permeated Christianity. That it is the spirit that lives on forever. No, it's the person when they are raised from the dead that will live on forever. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man when John saw Jesus. And he placed his right hand on me saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. And I was dead and behold, I am alive. Forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades, the grave. Hades is the grave. Jesus saying, I am raised. You know, it's, it's me, the person. Like I said, it's, it's sort of a difficult thing to show you because it's, I'm, I'm, counter, I'm counteracting the wrong things that are taught. So, uh, and which is a misinterpretation of the right things that are stated. Look at all the places where the resurrection is spoken of, and you'll see that it's always talking about the person being raised from the dead. Just like Jesus said, I am. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. When you get up from the dead, it will be you that gets up from the dead, not a part of you. Now, how's that going to happen? I don't know. It's a mystery. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 says. You know, well, well, what happens to the dead, to their, to their, who they are? Where does it go? And what, you know, so we've made up things. It goes back to the vault of God, and it's with God in the vault. I don't know any of that. All I know is, I mean, when Christ comes back, the dead are going to get up. How's God going to do that? Well, He's going to have to do a lot because I assure you that Paul's body is not around any longer. You understand? And he's going to have it's a, it's a, it's going to be a, it's a mystery. It says how it's going to happen. We'll find out when it happens. Then we can talk about how. Wow, that was cool how that happened. Uh, an interesting study would be, and you could do this online in your computer, is you could you type in Platonic beliefs that have influenced Christianity. You will marvel at how much Plato has influenced what people believe and how they embrace the things of Plato rather than the things of Christ. It's a, it's a sad testimony. So what's the big deal? What's the, what's the problem here? Well, the, and I, the, the manifestation of the lie, one of the things is uh, the Roman Catholics have invented this place called purgatory. 
Now, purgatory is a word like the word Trinity and like the word limbo that are not in the Bible. The word themselves are not in the Bible, nor is the concept. A Roman, it's a Ro purgatory is a Roman Catholic doctrine which, which puts forth that those who have died in a state of grace undergo a purification in order to achieve the holiness necessary to enter heaven. I got this from an encyclopedia. The souls in purgatory undergo temporal punishment due to the venial sins or a satisfaction due for their transgressions. They are aided by the prayer and suffering of the faithful and the sacrifice of the Mass. Henceforth, central to the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory is prayer for the dead. It is very common that Roman Catholic people who are Roman Catholic influence, they pray for the dead. You say, well, what are you doing? Being critical of the Roman Catholic Church? No, I'm not being critical of the Roman Catholic Church. There are millions and millions and millions of people that believe this. And there is not one iota of truth to it from the Scripture. They believe that a person is in, in purgatory burning, reaching for the time when they are prayed for enough that they can ascend into heaven. Why would someone believe that? Because they believe the dead are alive now. And they're not. The dead are dead. Then you have, you know, you have artwork such as being displayed here. You can see the souls at the bottom. They're in they're, the flames all around them. And then they're, I guess expect that's Mary or someone coming to them. And you can see the transformation as they're being lifted up into heaven. Well, that makes for nice artwork, but it's got absolutely no biblical grounds to it at all. So you have millions and millions and millions of people who are praying for dead people. Dead people who have no life. There's no reason to pray for dead people. There's plenty of reason to pray for people who are alive. Another major problem for this wrong belief is another devastating influence that it has had on society and it has since the beginning of the embracing of this doctrine is it gives way to spiritualism where people think that the dead are alive now and therefore now we have soothsayers and we have those that, that can speak to the dead. And, you know, they go to a seance and then someone at the seance says, you know, they, they say something to the person that, that assures them that, that this is their dead uncle, their mother, their father, their brother, their sister, so on. And they say something that only they and that person would know. And therefore proves to them that this dead person is alive. Why would anybody even consider for a moment that a dead person be alive if the Bible is the truth? Now there's a familiar spirit. There's a devil spirit that accompanies people, that watches and knows what we are about, that would know things about us, that could communicate it to someone they're possessing. And then tell them, you know, this is what happened with such and such a time because the devil's spirit saw it. But I assure you, this has nothing at all to do with Almighty God. Almighty God refers to this as being an abomination and disgusting. To him, it's repulsive that anybody would embrace anything to do with spiritualism. Any kind of spiritualism. Anything at all. Even if you say it's just innocent. It's just an innocent, fun TV show like Charmed or Sabrina. It's not innocent. It's not, it's not innocent at all. God says that it's an abomination and that those that practice therein are going to be punished in, in eternal wrath for it. It's not, it's not something to entertain ourselves with. We shouldn't be reading books that promote this kind of spiritualism such as Harry Potter or the Star Wars thing with a trilogy where, where, you know, this dead guy is talking to Luke. Dead people don't talk. Dead people are dead. If you've got somebody talking to you that's dead, you've got a devil spirit speaking to you. And that should be of concern to you. Well, where does all this come? This fuels this whole arena that is very much a part of our culture because of the wrong doctrine of, of the dead being alive now. The dead aren't alive. They're dead. Now, if they believe they're going to be alive, well, even if they don't believe, they're all going to, everybody's going to get up. There's going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust in the day of Christ. Now, look at Romans chapter 8. What practical ramification has this upon you and upon me that know this? Well, uh, well, if, our hope is the anchor of our soul. 
The hope is the way that we continue to live and to move and to have our being. The hope is what life is to be all about. In Romans chapter 8, verse 15. For, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, those are the sons of God. For we have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. If children, heirs, also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. It, you can't, it's not worthy to be compared, but I tell you what, over and over and over again we are told in the Scriptures to look at the comparison. Look at what it is that you're living for that comes in the future as compared to what is to be gained in the present if you compromise on your beliefs. For the, verse 19, for the anxi anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subject it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to the corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole of creation groans and suffers the pain of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we also, we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, we, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoption as sons, the, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what? For who hopes for what he already sees? If we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait it eagerly. We wait eagerly for it. Throughout the Scriptures, everyone that's ever taken a stand from God has had a full embracing of his or her hope. It's been understood, it's been embraced, it's been lived for. Doctrines such as I've communicated this morning, wrong doctrines, have misled people to thinking... You see, hope is not something that is seen. It's something that is future. We don't live by sight. We live by faith. We live by faith that Christ is coming back and that that day we will be raised from the dead if we are dead. And if we are alive, we will be changed. It really it erodes the core of what is to be Truly the faith of Christians, which is the gospel of the kingdom. The word gospel and kingdom are synonymous. That is to be what we embrace. That is to be what we live for. So there's so many other verses of Scripture. I was going to go back to Second Peter and where I began the teaching and show you again that the context of it, if you would read that chapter, you'll see the context of it is the return of Jesus Christ. And that the doctrines that are being falsified are in contradiction to the return of Jesus Christ and the knowledge that goes along with it. That the, the predominant wrong doctrine muddies and confuses people about what will happen in the end. And you've got to have a real clear picture of what's going to happen in the end if you're going to stand in this day of suffering. 